Thank you guys for having me today. I appreciate it. One of my favorite things is to work with young kids your age, college kids. I typically enjoy that most out of any age bracket that I work with. And one of the big reasons for that, I had so many struggles when I was your age. So many things that I held inside that, like the emotions that ran through my body on a day in and day out basis. And I know how hard it can be to be a teenager sometime. I have a 16 year old stepdaughter at home and you know, especially in the social media era, right, the guys you live in, sometimes your life has to be portrayed perfectly through a picture on Instagram, a video on TikTok, TikTok or Snapchat. And I, I see it's hard. I've worked with kids and I know it's hard. I'm 42 years old. I grew up in New Bedford, Massachusetts. And from a very young age, sports were a huge part of my life. See, my uncle was the head basketball coach at New Bedford High, and back then the landscape in the state was much different. Guys didn't go to prep school. Guys went to their city. They looked forward to playing at their city. The first away game I ever went to was in 1989 when I was eight years old, and I saw 5,000 people going crazy for a New Bedford Durfee game. I never wanted to be anywhere else. There was no such thing as Larry Bird. Magic Johnson didn't exist. That was my place of happiness. That's where I wanted to be. But in my school, we had 5,000 kids. I'm five foot nine, I'm average athletically, and basketball wasn't gonna be a big part of my life. I was probably good enough to make the team, and that's about it. And I found out in high school all the things that I was uncomfortable with, all the things I struggled with could be solved every time I picked up a drink. You know, every day waking up, I struggled when I looked in the mirror. I necessarily wasn't comfortable calling the girl I liked. If I saw a shirt I liked on a rack and I put it on me, I thought it never looked right. I always thought it looked funnier on me. There was an internal battle or a conflict I had that I went through every day. And there were certain guys at my school I looked up to that were older and certain cliques and crews that I would do anything to get in. And I really started drinking my sophomore year. I had started trying it from a very young age. My family, my heritage comes up from Europe, half Greek, half Portuguese, and from a young age, people would give me sips of beer. I'd be lying to you if I thought men weren't supposed to drink. That's what I saw. So that's what I did. Except it was different for me. By my junior year of high school, every weekend I would drink to the point of blacking out or throwing up. And then the next day I would get up and do it again if it was on a Saturday or a Sunday or a school vacation. I remember the first time I got really drunk. I drank Bacardi 151. I puked and puked and puked. And the next day I felt like death. I felt horrible. And my friends called me, I'll never forget it. The Patriots were playing the Jets, it was a Sunday, we were on Christmas vacation. And they were like, come on, we're going out tonight. And all day on the coach, I was like, I'm never going to do that again. I never want to feel like that. And that next night, I had a, a Corona bottle in my hand, and I was drinking. That's where I felt comfortable. All my emotions were pushed away. I started to like the guy in the mirror. I had a little bit more courage to talk to the girl. And that shirt that I hated on Wednesday, I thought it looked great on me on Saturday night. You know, and, and the hardest part about that was not being able to share that with anyone. Not being able to talk about that with anyone. You know, I held on to that stuff deep down. And it was something I struggled with. And by the age of 32, I was a homeless heroin addict. I checked into this place, Gosnold, and I had been there a bunch of times. And every time I walked into a place, I wanted you to think I had the best life. Everything was great. Are you kidding me? Look how happy I am. And I sat down in a chair, and the lady Louisa, who was my counselor again, and who knew me well and had seen me a few times in the last six weeks, and I sat down with a big smile on my face, and she said, Nicholas, let's go over your information. And I'm like, here we go. Nicholas, you don't have a car. Nicholas, you don't have a cell phone. You don't have a job. The state has you listed 
as without residency. So she said, technically, you're 32 and you're homeless. How does that feel? And even though I didn't want her to think I heard what she was saying, it hit me a little bit. I had friends that were getting married. I had friends that had houses. I had friends that had kids. I had a trash bag of clothes, man. Not a dollar to my name. How did it get like that? At what point did something change inside of me? Something that made me want nothing but drugs. See, when I woke up as a heroin addict, that's all I thought about. When I went to bed, that's all I thought about. And the amount of anxiety and panic I would have when I would wake up without drugs or money is the worst feeling in the world. And waking up to drugs, knowing I had drugs, I thought was the best feeling. I wake up early every day. I wake up between 4 and 4.30 every day. Sometimes it's not that easy to wake up. It's tough, man, when you don't sleep good, you're tired. You know how life is. If I knew I had heroin in my nightstand, I was up like I was going to go watch the Super Bowl and had front row seats and backstage passes. And it didn't start with heroin, guys. It started with those cans of beers. It started with the $2.99 bottles of Mad Dog 2020 that we would get at the liquor store. It started with joints we rolled with zigzags and Philly blunts. It turned into mushrooms. It turned into hallucinogenics. It turned into cocaine. It turned into pain pills. Pain pills, I added some Xanax. I added some Valium. And then when the money's gone, there's only one thing to get where I'm from, and it's heroin. See, I could get heroin for $40 a bag. It was $30 for a Perk 30. It's going to be six Perk 30s to equal that $40 bag of heroin. I'm going to take the heroin all day long. And it's tough. It's really hard when you're living in that situation. You know, my mother, I was talking to Mel about this, and uh, my mother did more for me than any human being. And I'd be in the bathroom, and she'd be like, Nicholas, Nicholas, Nicholas. And I'd be crying, doing lines of heroin, because I couldn't stop. My mother's the only person that endured the struggle probably worse than me. When I was five years sober, my mother dropped dead of a heart attack. I had just gotten out of a relationship. I moved back home. And out of that relationship, I left the place I was living in. And my plans were to move back in my parents for the first time in years, four years sober. And I heard a boom. And I went downstairs, and my mother was on the floor dead. My mother was tired. But the hottest part about that was I believed deep, deep down that I took years off my mother's life. There was a thousand times my mother said, please answer. I just want to talk. Mom, leave me alone. She would text me. I would ignore her. She would knock on my door. I would tell her to get out. And when I was talking to this young girl who I've made a great connection with, I said to her, she was mad at her mom one day. And I said, Liz, the crazy things about moms the hardest thing about moms is one day they're not going to be there. One day, you're going to wish to see your mom call you. She can't do it. You're going to die for a text message, but she can't type it to send it. And if it wasn't for my mom, I wouldn't be standing upright, and that's just the truth. And my life is good now, you know? But my mom didn't get to see my three-year-old son born, and that's all she ever wanted. She wanted a, a grandkid, and he died. She died 11 months almost to the day he was born. So I went through all those things, and I endured all that. And I was in a slow learner's club, see? I didn't want to get it at first. I didn't try to get it. I would get sent to treatment. I would use as soon as I came home. I didn't want to give up the drink or the drug. And I was able to mask it. I was coaching college basketball. I was coaching high school football. I was coaching high school basketball. And I had some pretty good players that were around me. And there were years I was able to function and coach and recruit good players. 
and get guys to come play for me. But eventually the wheels came off. And in the end of April of 2013, I was in the city of Fall River and I was checking into this place called Star. And again, I was in a detox. And this time I was feeling like this was the worst that ever was for me. I was completely consumed by drugs and nothing else. I had no emotions, no feelings. I don't even feel like I had a soul at that moment of my life. And the thing about Fall River is that's where my dad grew up. And I'm, I'm checking into this place and my aunt worked there and she said, Nicholas, please don't use. And I said, I won't. And see, every time I went into treatment, I had to use. And it was also an opportunity for me to get some money from you to get some more drugs. And sometimes I used it as an excuse just to get 40 or $50 to get high one more time. And I checked into this treatment center. And it had been a rough patch for me. There had been a lot of detoxes, suboxone clinics, methadone clinics. I was going to all these programs for drug addicts, except I wasn't putting any energy or effort into it. And I walk in and I'm not feeling good and I, they said, this is your bed and I have a room with 13 beds in it. And the withdrawals were really hitting me and they wouldn't give me my methadone. And I walk in in a video of Chris is playing in the TV room and I feel guilty because a year before he paid for my treatment and I feel like I let him down. And I said to the nurse, can I please just have my methadone so I can go to sleep? And she said, your vitals say you're fine. And I lost my temper. I grabbed my plastic bag full of clothes and I walked. And it was a cold, rainy April day in my grandparents' house. My father's mother and father, they had an old farm on Meridian Street in Fall River. And every Sunday I would go there as a kid and it was a place I had some of the best memories of my childhood. And I'm walking with a plastic bag on my shoulder in the cold, raw, rainy day of April. And I'm thinking, my grandparents have been dead for years. What if I can just go to their barn and light a fire? If I can light a fire and find some heroin, I can just stay there. Then I won't bother my mother anymore. I won't bother anyone. And I can just live in that barn. And as long as I have heroin, my life will be perfect. And then as I got to my grandparents' house, I had no phone. I had no money. I didn't know how I could get heroin. And I was hurting really, really bad. And something clicked inside of me and I started to think about my mom. It was probably the first time in years I thought about anyone else besides myself. And I turned around after I sat down for a few minutes and I walked into the Newport Creamery and I asked the lady to use her phone. And I called my mother and I said, come get me. And she said, Nicholas, I don't feel comfortable with you coming home. And I said, just give me till Tuesday. It was a Saturday afternoon. I went, I got a Suboxone which blocks the withdrawals from opiates. And I was at home by myself. And I started to feel different emotions than I ever felt. And my grandmother, my mother's mother, she lived with us a lot when I was a child. And at 32 years old, I was back at my parents' house. And my grandmother had a ton of religious relics. She was a very religious woman. And I had a statue of Jesus in my bedroom I was staying in, and I fell to my knees. And for the first time in years, I started to cry. And it was like I let out 20, 20 years of pain. It just came out of me. And I just asked God to help me and to help me find myself. And that Tuesday, I went back to Gosnold. And that's when that lady, Louisa, mentioned to me about being homeless. And it was the first time that I didn't have an answer after she met with me. It was the first time I kept my mouth shut. I took suggestions. And I did what I needed to do instead of Nick doing what he wanted to do. I wanted to do things my way my whole life. I was a horrible student. I got asked to leave the college I was at. I was at Western New England College playing Division III football. 
I was a very average player in high school. We had very good teams. And I went home with a, like a .1 GPA. My poor parents worked so hard to send me there. And again, Nick did it his way. I failed out. It was a joke. I never took anything serious. So I decided to, to listen. And Chris's brother, Mike, had been a big influence. He says that my mother called him more than any person, any mom from the, from the years he helped with the heroin project. And I went away to long-term treatment. And I was gone for about seven months. And I had to overcome a lot of things, you know? There was a lot of things I had buried deep down inside from the 16-year-old that was drinking beers on a Saturday to hide those emotions of the mirror. I had no job. I had nothing to go back to. It was finally time for me to do this. And interesting enough, I think I spoke, it was about nine years ago at the old high school. And you know, May 1st will be 10 years sober for me. But what I've learned is, what I've learned is that it's not all about me. See, I always wanted it to be just about me. I had tons of insecurities mixed in with the ego. Now I'm blessed. I have a son. I have a stepdaughter. I have a fiance. I have a house. I have a job that's not like a job where I get to help people on a day in and day out basis. I train some of the best athletes in New England, some of the best in the country. One of the young men I trained just got the Big East player of the year, Tyler Kolick. How cool is that? From a guy that had to use a phone at Newport Creamery because I didn't have one to be training guys that are getting the Big East Player of the Year. I got two playing in their conference tournament today. I got to drop my son off at daycare, and then I got to come here with you people, you know? I know what it's like when you're a teenager and you feel uncomfortable. I know there's probably someone in this room right now who has some type of addiction or alcoholism that has hit their family. I know there's someone in this room right now that looks in the mirror and feels uncomfortable. I get it, man. Don't ever feel like you're by yourself. Use the people around you that love you and care about you. You don't have to fit in. See, all my life, your opinion meant more to me than my opinion of myself. What I thought didn't matter, what you thought did. And all those uncomfortable feelings pushed me to do things, to fit in and do things, to belong until it was too late. Until the things I did to fit in and the things I did to belong ruled my life. I was trapped in the hell of addiction and alcoholism and had no idea how to get out. And if I'm being honest, for years I didn't want to. See, I was afraid to succeed. I never thought I was good enough. I didn't think I could make it out. I thought that I was stupid, worthless, and that I was incapable of doing anything worthwhile. Even coming, talking to you guys and getting a little emotional is hard for me because I'm talking about things that are deep to my heart because it means something to me. And I feel like God has blessed me with putting the young kids in my life because if I'm being honest, if I was in your shoes today, I probably would have came in high. I didn't smoke cigarettes, but I probably would have vaped. And I just want you to know that when I smoked weed, I'd said I'd never do cocaine. And when I did cocaine, I said I'd never do heroin or Percocets. And I had a lot of yets in my life. I've robbed, I've stole. I've done things that I have to live with for the rest of my life. I didn't want to do them. The drugs got the best of me. I've been in situations with other people where I'm the only one still standing upright when no one else from the car that day has made it out alive. I've seen more young kids die from the disease of addiction in the last three years than I could ever imagine. People I was very close with. And I will tell you this, my mother was the most important person in my life until my son was born. The hardest thing I've ever had to do, and there's not even a close second, is walk up in a funeral line, look a mother in the eyes, and give her a hug. 
while her 20-something-year-old daughter laid behind her in a casket. There's nothing that I've done that even comes close to that. That single event affected me mentally more in my life and emotionally than anything ever has. I feel like I failed. This young lady was like my little sister, my stepdaughter, and I had to look at her dead body in a casket. And then I had to hug her mom and look her mom in the eyes and think to myself, what did I do wrong? How did I feel, this girl? Why am I standing and she's dead? We did the same drugs. And I promise you, the day that girl picked up and used, her intentions weren't to have her parents have a funeral mass for her. She didn't want the people she loved having to look at her dead body. But that's the end game. That's the result. That's life sometimes. And I wish to say she was the last person that was a young kid that I know that died, but she's not. And instead of trying to hold on to negative emotions, I try to live for these young guys and girls or friends I've had that have died from addiction, and I try to honor them by coming in and speaking to young people like you so that the hopes that one of you puts the vape down today that one of you goes home and tells your mom you love her. Thanks the person that's been taking care of you your whole life. Goes up to the kid that no one will sit with and say, I got you, man. I'm gonna sit next to you today. Because that's all we can do is help each other and support each other I went to the circles that brought me down. I went to the bar rooms with the cheapest drinks. I went to the drug dealers with the strongest drugs. And it literally killed my mother slowly to the point where she only got to see me five years sober. And I'm very grateful for that. But she has four sisters, and Christmas time comes, and I see all her sisters hold their grandkids, and I'm like, man, I wish my mom could hold my son. I wish I could have had one picture, just one, with my mom and my son. You know, And I believe my mother's with me in every step I take. I believe those people I lost are with me in every step I take. And I hope, and I feel, that they see the path I'm walking in now. Yesterday I had a blessed day. I woke up at 4.30 and I worked till seven at night, but I got to be a part of so many people's lives. I trained six basketball players yesterday. One was a younger kid, the rest of them were all division one athletes. One's a guard from BC, one plays over in Portugal. Another young, two other young men were rising stars, they'll be division one guys and another plays at Sacred Heart. And it's about the relationship I've developed with those young people that I talked about earlier. Able to see them, they come and see me when they're home on spring break. They come and see me when they're home from other countries after they play. I like to think they're a part of my son's life and a positive role model and mentor for him. I want my son to be in the gym. I don't want my son going into bar rooms. I want my son to come up to me and say, Dad, there's a few kids at my school smoking weed and I don't know how to say no, can you help me? I want my son not to feel like the peer pressure from his peers is gonna make him do things he really doesn't wanna do, things that are gonna go against his moral compass like his dad did for years. And then when my moral compass switched, I went from the person saying yes that didn't want to to the person peer pressuring so I wouldn't have to feel alone.
This can be a tricky age. It's hard. You want to fit in. You want to feel good. Sometimes in some days when you don't feel good, even if you do something that goes against your beliefs, if you get approval from others, that validation will continue to do it. It's been a long road for me, but it's in a, been a road that's been worth every step. I feel like God has put me here to do things and give me an opportunity to do things, and that's why I'm still standing upright. I want to kind of open it up. Mel sent me some questions. Miss Bauer sent me some questions, and I'd like to kind of open it up to you guys for any question I might not have answered or any questions you have. So that was, that was the whole reason I drank and did drugs. But the problem was when I did it, and it, it masked all those uncomfortable feelings and emotions I had, I didn't need to be peer pressured anymore because all the things I struggled with, it took away. But the problem was I don't have the ability to shut it off. I don't have an off switch. So some of my friends that peer pressured me that could have four beers and stop, I didn't have that capability. And all I wanted was approval from all of my peers so they could have told me to do anything and I would have done it for their approval. And I did that for years until I was kind of hooked on cocaine and was kind of like out of that high school, college um, age landscape, you know? I speak about it. I think that's one of, that's a great question. You know, for me, it's not like Friday and Saturday nights when I was younger, I used to always want to go out drinking. For me, that's not when I get my cravings, you know? I don't get them all the time, but if I'm driving in the summertime and it's nice out and I have the roof on my car open and I'm on a back road in the country and I see one of those electric blue lights flash on a convenience store, it catches my eye. But I've been, I've been kind of trained now from the people that have taught me how to live in recovery to just be brutally honest. And if it doesn't go away in one or two minutes, pick up the phone and call someone. Because if I don't, that car's going right back in that parking lot and I'm going in the store. You know, that was a great question. Who else has a question? Don't be shy, man. You can ask me anything you want. Yeah, it's a guy I grew up with. His name's Kevin, and he was the first person to actually bring me to a non-court-ordered AA meeting. And I still go to meetings, and I still help the newcomer, and when I go to meetings, I still raise my hand because so many times I would think I had things under control, and I'd be like, I'm good, and in reality, I'm not a unicorn, I'm not different. I need to do it the exact way it was laid out for me to be successful. And then if I kind of don't do that, then I believe I'm not really living the life I'm supposed to be living. It's like a double sorted life, you know? And anytime I've done stuff like that, it hasn't worked out for me. Basketball, football would be 1B, but one of the things that I train a lot more basketball players, so instead of being like a fan of a team, I'm a fan of my guys, and I really enjoy being able to watch them play the given sport. So if I have someone that I'm really close with and he plays on a certain team, even if it was a different sport, I'd probably root for that team more. So I guess because of the basketball players, it would be basketball right now, and um, it's pretty cool for me to watch these guys on TV. So it's interesting because I've worked with some high-level schools and I can tell you they've done performance modules where they've done scientific research and it shows how much it will decrease your level of ability when you vape, when you smoke, or you drink. If I'm being honest, a lot of my high-level guys, a lot of the people I train, they don't really do that. 
and they have pretty open relationships with me, and they talk to me about anything. You know, I've trained guys from every Super 6 conference. I had a kid at Duke who I trained like 10 times. They got Rookie of the Year, Kyle Flipowski. I've been with Tyler Kolick for years. Aaron Gray, he plays at Niagara. He's in the MAC. He averaged 15 a game this year as a sophomore. Those guys are really open and honest with me. You know, I had one of my other guys who's going to a Big Ten school call me. Um, not about that, but about some emotional stuff. And they take everything very serious because at the end of the day, they're all trying to do it for a living or get a free education. You know, and if that's what you really want, you'll never be as good as you can be when you do that stuff, I promise you. That's a great question. So that's what happened to me. And what happens is you rely on it and it becomes your way out. And any time a substance or something unhealthy becomes your way out, you are going to want more of it. It's a Band-Aid. Whatever is causing the anxiety, the only thing that is going to fix that is speaking about that, talking about that, working through that, learning how to cope with it in a healthy manner. One of the scariest things I've ever seen is when teenagers I work with that start smoking for anxiety the smoking becomes so much. I've seen multiple teenagers in marijuana psychosis. It is one of the scariest things I've ever seen in my life. When I tell you people that are elite athletes in high school, that are elite students, can't even put their sneakers on and tie their shoes, I promise you it's real. Shuffling feet, drool, shakes, unable to even function. And what people don't realize is not everyone comes out of that. You know, and it's usually when it progresses from the stuff you roll into the stuff you smoke into a pipe into the dab pens. Because it's just like hitting a vape. And if you vaped and you just keep ripping the vape without knowing it, and when you start doing it to the dab pen, it's gonna change the chemistry of your brain and you are going to lose complete control of who you are in your body. And it happens faster than you think. It's crazy. Like, just thinking about the faces of the people still blows my mind. I wish they had videos so you guys could see what it looked like. Find someone they trust, find someone they admire, and just ask for help. Just be honest. It's okay not to be okay. It's okay to need help. It becomes a problem when you don't want to do anything about it. It becomes a problem when you're afraid to address it. Because then you hold on to it. It stays inside you. And even if you're capable of burying it, eventually, other things that you need to vent or let go, you're going to hold on to, and they're just going to pile on top. And when there's no more room for all that negative emotion to go, the volcano's going to explode. And something's going to happen that's not going to be fun. I've been in institutions, I've been in Ash Street Jail in New Bedford multiple weekends, I've been in the back of ambulances, and I promise you, I didn't plan on any of it. The hot, most horrible feeling, multiple times I had to get rushed out on a stretcher in front of my neighborhood as a grown man, strapped down to an ambulance. My neighbor was the EMT one time, and he like came in my house. And I'm like throwing up, convulsing, 
you know, maybe in the worst condition of my life, so much so that I was like trying to kick the doors open on the ambulance on 24 on the way to Charlton Memorial from Freetown. I promise you I didn't plan on any of that when I was your age. I promise you when I walked into the assembly high, I said that was never going to be me. I promise you when I saw those type of people on the corner in downtown New Bedford, I said, look at that, look at that bum. Look at that junkie. How did he let his life get like that? I didn't ever think I would be that person. I didn't even think my first lifting partner was going to be found by his mother eight days before Christmas with a needle hanging out of his arm. I promise you he didn't either. But I promise you that those things all happened. And they continue to happen around me on a month by month, week by week, day in by day out basis. I've probably known in just 2023 alone at least 25 to 30 people that have died of an overdose. Some not even that much older than you. Some that were probably in high school while you were. So I didn't want to find help for myself. I had to have people around me I love, like my mom I talk about, find help for me. But I wasn't going to listen to someone I didn't trust and admire giving me the advice to get that help. It becomes like a team effort. Sometimes it takes a village. But if you don't ask, or you will never say anything or hold it in, that person's never going to get help anyway. I just try to be consistent, you know? Uh, my brain, the way it works, more is always better. As I've been in recovery for almost 10 years now, I've learned that that's not always the answer for me. I just try to stay consistent, you know? I'm getting older, I'm 42, so listen, if you don't think I want some Chick-fil-A, I promise you I do, but I know what happens when I eat that stuff too much. So I try to just eat things that I know are healthy, and try to do things in moderation. And I try to pay attention to it, you know, and make sure for me, I need three to four or five workouts a week for my mental health. I don't work out for the mirror anymore. I work out for the way it makes me feel. I had a really nice guidance counselor, Mrs. Ayot. I'm sure I could have spoke to her about it. But if I'm being honest, like, I didn't know of anything and you kind of, I don't want to say forced, but if you were on the team and you didn't drink, you were kind of looked at like you didn't belong. It was kind of like a rite of passage, you know, where it was not only socially accepted, but expected. And I think now with the education now, like, we're learning like there's other healthier ways and other things to outlet, outlet um, and do recreational even, just drink and smoke because of the road it can lead us down. Yeah, I think it takes a lot of courage to do that. Yeah. And How it did they get that? How did you gain that kind of courage? It takes one. It takes one. Someone that is a natural leader, someone that isn't afraid of what other people's opinions are going to be of them, someone that doesn't necessarily want to sit on the table where people are trying to fight for seats. You know, I don't know if there's a certain routine to do it. I think it's one of those things when everything inside of you is telling you it's wrong and it's not right. It's just about standing up and stopping it, you know. It's very hard. That stuff's the hardest stuff to do, especially at this age, you know. It usually, in my experience, takes a leader in the crowd or a young person that people look out to 
to change the culture. It's very similar in sports, you know, like when I work guys out or when I work out groups of guys, I want a certain culture created. And you have to get the best person or a person to buy in. I think maybe as a, a, a professional, like having a one-on-one -on -one conversation with someone that is kind of admired by the student body and challenging them to rise up and challenging them to think about other people and the students think outside their comfort zone to do something that they know they want to but don't know how to and don't feel they can. You know, um, leaders are very important in anything you do, job, home, life, friend circles. Without good leaders, the rest of the bad, uh, attitude reflects leadership, right? If I'm on a team, it's interesting. I'm not going to say what team. I'm good friends with a coach. He coaches in the NBA in a prestigious organization, and they traded someone, and their team's been playing much better, and he said the chemistry in the locker room is finally where we needed it. That's at the highest level, so it's everywhere. But it takes a certain quality of a person to do that, you know? Those little things, though, like being able to do that and standing up for that could be things that pave a road for you or get you down a place you never thought you could imagine, you know? You do something like that and all of a sudden it feels as good as vaping or smoking and you get a completely different mindset and you chase healthiness and you chase good instead of chasing the group and chasing the peer pressure and chasing the popularity that most kids, you know, feel like they need and want. No, I don't think it was the school system. It was me. I failed me because, if I'm being honest, I coasted, you know. Um, when, I got, when I got comfortable with drugs and alcohol, that kind, of, that kind of trumped everything. Not even football, nothing was as important as that. And, you know, at the end of my high school career, I got a, a fake ID. And I remember, like, literally drinking every night. I, I think it was just, like, the culture was like that back then. I was still able to get in college. I still went to go play college football. It was just me versus me a lot of the time. And um, that courage that she talked about, like not being able to um, stand up. You know, when I, when I came home from college and I got asked to leave, I didn't have a license till I was 19. And thank God, because I probably, probably would have gotten a DUI or died earlier because I, I got, I think like eight, I totaled eight cars between 19 and 22, you know, but one of my friends, who would give me a ride home. We worked in the winter together and he said, I said, I've been really depressed and miserable. And he said, that's because you've become an alcoholic. And I never heard anyone say that to me. And I was only 18 years old. But if I think about how my brain thought and processed things back then, like literally at the end of college when I was up there, like the only thing that made me happy was drinking, you know? So it's one of those things where I could say it was them, but deep down it was probably more like me being lazy and doing what I wanted instead of what I needed. Good question. Yeah, so like I was probably like that guy that stopped getting invited to weddings. You know, jobs, working with friends, people getting nervous, like seeing the look on my family's face when I would like walk in Christmas or Easter, you know? I don't know if people completely removed themselves from me, but I wasn't getting phone calls and texts to hang out anymore, you know? And uh, I remember the first thing though, like one of my friends getting married and not getting invited and I was real upset, but looking back now, I'm surprised more people didn't do it. And then just like, you know, when I lost like coaching, like making all these promises, and, and volunteering to do all these things that I knew damn well I wasn't going to be able to because all that I cared about was drugs. It's actually pretty wild that you asked me that because the coaching towards the end was impacted. Uh, one thing I'll share with you about it, we want to talk about losses. When I was coaching at UMass Dartmouth, I had always wanted to coach and try to move up. And I was talking to the coach at Stonehill and they were a Division II school, and they were ranked in the top 20 every year. And I got a DUI the Friday before the interview on Monday. I lost that opportunity. And then I doubled down the following year. 
my cousin Ryan, whose father was Coach Rodericks, my mentor, has taught me everything I know about coaching, was playing at Bentley College. He was playing at a school called Bloomfield, right? And it was the opening game in men's division two. So Stonehill was in this conference called the NE10. Every coach in New England from the NE10 was at this game. I show up, it's a Friday night, on every drug I could take, completely annihilated, and I get taken out in handcuffs in front of every member of my family and every coach. Like literally, they, the whole police force at Bentley came around, cuffed me, and you know, it wasn't that part that bothered me. I felt bad for my mom, but all the parents that were there from Bentley stood up and applauded the police as I was getting dragged out in cuffs. And like all those coaches are seeing that, and that kind of derailed me from coaching. If I'm being honest, I didn't have any plan on ever getting back in it. It kind of happened with me volunteering one night, two years into sobriety, a coach not showing up, and then during the COVID, it, it, it really took off, and I've, I've done well, but, and I'm lucky that that's happened, but I thought that could have been something that I lost that was a huge part of my life. Who's an athlete in here? I mean, I've worked out people from Alabama, Georgia, Florida State, Wisconsin, Miami, Florida, Marquette, Iowa, BC, PC, UMass Amherst. No questions from the athletes? How many of you guys want to play at the next level? Be real, man. You don't have to. What are some of the things that drive you? What sport do you play? What's your name? How'd you do this year for hockey? Yeah, you guys have done a pretty good job uh, as far as the whole school. The programs here are pretty good. What are some of the things you think you need to improve on to play at the next level? How do you do that? Work ethic will eliminate those people. Because one thing I've noticed, not everyone wants to work hard. So if you put more time and energy and effort into honing your skills and becoming a better hockey player, you're gonna have to sacrifice something. In times when people are going out, in times where people don't wanna get up at 5 a.m. to work out with you, you're gonna find you're around them less and less. And that's gonna help you get to the direction you need to go instead of to the direction where you're at. You want to play at the next level, right? Mm -hmm. Did a good job this year, right? What are some of the things you want to work on? As far as what? So the interesting thing that you mentioned that, how many of you guys watch college basketball? How many of you guys know who Tyler Kolick is? Tyler Kolick is a Cumberland native who went to George Mason and wasn't highly recruited. And he got the rookie of the year in that conference. And he went to Marquette last year and he had a pretty good year passing the ball. But he was an unbelievable shooter his whole life. And statistically, he had his worst year ever shooting the basketball. And he followed that up with the Big East player of the year. So I think someone that's young, like you can get down, I understand that, but don't ever let a bad game or a missed shot stop you from your dream. The only remedy for that is let the work show. What did Tyler do? Tyler made 500 jump shots in the morning and Tyler made sure he made 500 at night. Sounds like a big sacrifice. What's the reward? The reward is for him who wants to, who, all he's ever wanted to do is play basketball at the highest level, was to win the Big East Player of the Year, win the Big East Regular Season Championship, and play UConn at, the Madison, at Madison Square Garden today at 6.30. So like those are the things where like, 
you know, you young kids, you young people, like don't let a bad moment, a suspension, a breakup, a friend that's not talking to you anymore, to tear you from your dreams. We're all gonna have bad moments. I had a lot of them. I had bad years. That's a lot of bad months and bad weeks and bad days. But I never let it stop me. It motivated me, it helped me be resilient, and it forced me to work harder. And I always believe the work will show. Every single one of you has to take tests in here. You know what it's like if you don't study. Hopefully it's multiple choice so I can guess. But I know if I study, and I know if I do all my homework assignments, and I know I prepare myself, I'm gonna be able to take the test. See, all sports are our test, and the games is where you get your grade. Well, what is your homework? You're at practice with a team. What are you doing on your own? If that's what you really wanna do, if you really wanna be a good student, how much are you doing for that? If you're not financially able to get to college, what are you doing to get a scholarship? Whether it's academically, athletically, you know, are you putting in that work? Usually in my experience, there's three. There's social, there's athletics, and there's academics. You're probably only gonna have a chance to be good at two when you're a student. Which one do you wanna give up? You can be average at three, or you can be really good at two. What do you want? When you do things or when you make a mistake, don't blame the coach, don't blame your parents, and don't get down. Watch film, see how you can get better. If you fail a test, review it with a teacher, see where you made my, your mistakes, work on it. The next test you will do better. And it's the same thing in life. If you keep doing something on a day in day out basis and you start to feel bad about yourself and you can't stop, ask someone to help you. There's people in your life, I'm sure, that would be willing to help you and take five minutes out to answer a phone call or a text message. We have easy access to millions of people now with social media and in the, in the internet. When I was in high school, we had America Online and it would do like this weird noise and it would dial up and my parents couldn't use the phone. Technology has come a long way. What are you using it for, you know? Are you using it to do things to seek validation or are you using it for good? You know, I think those things for you young guys and girls is really important, you know? Especially if you do something and you feel bad about it after. You know, it's hard too because things go around, right? A bad picture, a bad moment, everything gets captured on camera. Like Miss Bauer said, you know, don't be the kid that pulls the camera out if you don't like it when it happens to you, you know? I think those things are really, really important. I think it's horrible how everything is, is, is really portrayed your life through a lens and the amount of pressure you guys and girls have on yourself because of social media. You know, it's tough. It's tough, especially for the young girls. I see it, you know? Pictures are supposed to look a certain way. That image in the mirror probably means a little bit more than it does to some of the guys, and that's just the way it is. You know, those are the things that, that are really, really hard and sometimes we don't have the answers for, but hopefully someone in your life can help you out with it. So COVID actually helped me because what happened was a lot of my guys got sent home and it was a nicer time of the year so my training actually spiked. And guys that I typically wouldn't see anymore that were at college got to spend more time with me. So it definitely helped me tenfold. Now, it hurt a lot of my athletes because they were quarantined or they were stuck in rooms, you know? And I would say this, I got more phone calls and messages from young people that were stuck at colleges than I ever have in my life in a time span because of being in a room for seven days in a row, 14 out of 15 days or whatever. But me personally, it definitely helped me. Who else? One more question. Well, with the way addiction and alcoholism is now, I believe every person probably knows someone that was affected by it. 
most of the people I meet that are alcoholics or addicts like myself, it's kind of like a creed or a code, like if someone came and talked to me about it, I would never run and tell anyone unless it was to get someone help, you know? So that's one thing I can say, like if you feel like it's a pressing issue or you feel like it's a situation that keeps knocking you down, don't be afraid to talk to someone you know about it, you know? It, it could be something that really, really stopped a bunch of things from happening. I think it's not about, you know, telling you guys now it, it's about educating you and trying to get you to stop before you stop or get in too deep. Because once you get in too deep, then it becomes a war and it can become a living hell. If we can get you educated and get you feeling a certain type of way, hopefully you don't ever get to the point I did. Thank you guys so much. I really enjoyed it. You guys were great. You sat here very patient and quiet. I have a tough time doing that, you know, and I'm a grown man, you know, so I appreciate you guys giving me your undivided attention and being such a great audience. And thank you for some of the questions and when I asked you guys being open and honest too. If you ever need anything from me, please don't hesitate. If it's something you wanna to talk to me about in private, grab me. The easiest way to reach me is on Instagram. It's under Coach Nick Performance. If you need to send me a message, feel free. Just tell me you were in here and that you wanna talk and then we can go from there. But thank you guys so much.